this uh, lecture we're going to look at a measure of relationship between a couple of the between a pair of uh, variables or sets of data which measure something in a quantitative sense of the word. So they're, they're uh, quantitative measures, usually discrete or continuous. Let's take ourselves into PowerPoint and see what we're talking about here. So what's the correlation all about? Well, going to our example of number of visits to the doctor, we've got a couple of numerical, or a few numerical variables here. We've got some variables which are categorical, like these things here. Male variable here is a one or uh, indicating the person's male and a zero if they're a female. But the other uh, columns are representing uh, what you might call quantity, or the, the numerical measures. So how many times did you visit the doctor? What is your age? How many years of school have you had? How much income do you earn per month? So we're interested in a relationship between a pair of those. For example, is there a correlation between how many times you visit the doctor and your income, as, as a case in point? So here's uh, actually what we're going to do with this data is concentrate on these two columns. So put aside for the moment our interest in how many times people visit the doctor and just concentrate on a connection between how much education you've got and how much income you earn. Hopefully we're going to find a relationship because otherwise all that investment that you're making in you know, turning up to uni and trying to study hard and get yourself a degree or two or three, whatever you're onto, um, may be a waste of time if it doesn't translate to something in the terms of a job and income and the like. So here's the data that you saw on the previous page plotted in what we call a scatter diagram. It's the first tool that we have at our disposal to try and figure out the relationship between these two variables. So on this axis we have what we call X, which is uh, years of education. And over here we have the monthly income of a person. So each dot here, take this dot here, represents a particular person. So this looks like a person with must be about 11.5 years of schooling and they earn $10,000 a month. Gosh, they're doing not so bad. And then you have other people along the way. Um, so you've got people down to about here who essentially made their way through the end of high school. And then after that you've got people who did university degrees. Perhaps one degree stops about here and a second degree takes them all the way up to here. So, what's the purpose of a scatter diagram? Well, it's to really get a visual look at whether or not there's any relationship at all between X and Y. So in this case, you'd probably say there's a hint of a positive relationship as your education level goes up, so does your income. So if you sort of, perhaps if I was to kind of put a, where the data goes, I might suggest it goes something like that. But that's only a gentle, modest, positive relationship, and there's certainly a lot of variability around it. So the tool that we've got here is the thing called the scatter diagram, and it allows us to address three questions. Number one, is there a relationship at all between X and Y? So remember, we're in the category here of diagnostic analytics. We're looking to discover patterns in data. So the, the, the scatter diagram is one of those visual tools that we have at our disposal to, to get a quick impression of that, or whether there is any patterns between in relating X and Y. So here's a graph where there clearly is a pattern. There's a, Pattern here of uh, whenever X gets bigger, so does Y. You know, some fluctuations around that, but there's quite a clear pattern to those dots. Whereas here, you'd say probably not. This is just seeming like a random collection of dots. No real pattern. So that's the first thing you can do with a scan diagram, answer that question. Second thing, what's the direction of the relationship, assuming there is one? Here's a case in point where uh, the relationship is positive. X goes up, Y tends to also go up. And this is the, the example here you've got is how much people, how many ice creams people buy. And that tends to go up the temperature. People don't tend to buy too many ice creams when it's less than 20 degrees or even the low 20s. But as the temperature gets up into the high 20s and 30s, then you see the demand for ice cream actually increase. Not surprisingly. It's hot, you need something to cool you down. So that's a positive relationship. And over here we have a negative relationship in that as this X variable inc increases along this way, then you tend to see that the Y variable tends to go down. Um, the example we have here is the price of ice creams. 
if they, if they get too expensive, people will buy less of them. This is what in economics you refer to as your demand curve, where you've got uh, the, the price increasing and the demand going down. People can't afford four dollar ice creams, so they buy less of them compared to two dollar ice creams, for example. Just a little point: when we plot our scatter diagram, we always plot what we think is the sort of x factor against the y factor, and x typically x causes y, at least we think it might. And that's the reason we choose, that that's the basis on which we choose which is the x factor and which is the y factor. When you do demand curves in economics, for some reason in economics, we usually put quantity and price this way and draw a demand curve this way, which is kind of almost the wrong way around because we tend to think that price causes demand. So in the statistical sense of the word, we should actually have our graph with price on this axis and quantity on that axis. But but that's just the tradition that's in economics and there's some actually good reasons for that because the argument is that quantity and price interact with each other, uh, both cause each other rather than price clearly causing quantity demanded. So another point for another time. Okay, second question, what direction is the relationship? And the third question, is the relationship linear? And this is important because later on when we start to do predictive analytics, we're going to have to start building models and the model that we build is going to be a linear model. And in particular, in, in addition, even in the present, we're come up talking about a measure called the correlation. The correlation is a measure of linear connection between variables. So we need to know whether the, the, the two factors relate in some kind of a linear way. So in this case here, it looks pretty much like it's a fairly linear type thing. As x goes up, y goes up. So it's positive, And it tends to go up. If you were to kind of follow that pattern, you'd have to say it's pretty close to a straight line. Whereas here, the relationship between maximum temperature for the day and how much electricity people use is most definitely not linear. In fact, it's U-shaped. Why is that? Well, people tend to use electricity at home, especially when it's really cold, so they use their heaters, and when it's really hot, so they use their air conditioners. And the times that we use the least amount of electricity is when temperatures are just at that mild to warm level where we don't need a heater and we don't need a cooler. So you do get that pattern there. And that's important, as I say, because the measure of correlation that we come up with will not be really designed to capture this kind of relationship here. There's clearly a pattern there, but it won't show up in a correlation. So what does correlation do? Well, basically it measures the strength and the direction of a rela linear relationship between x and y. So is there a direction and how strong is it? So far we've been able to sort of learn, yes, it, by just looking at the scatter diagram, we've got some idea about whether there is a relationship and what direction it is. But this allows us now to, to quantify that relationship in terms of how strong it is with a number. Here's the formula for the correlation. It's a little bit ugly looking formula, but it's not too bad. Essentially what it builds around is the deviations, just like we learnt in the past about variance. The quantity that really matters to us is this quantity here. The deviation of x around its mean. But we also want to line that up against the deviation of y around its mean. And then so that we can produce a measure that's got standardized units, we're going to standardize these by their standard deviations. And don't worry about that for too much. Just just uh, trust me on that. But that, that's the standardization that you do so that when we calculate the correlation, we're going to get a number that's within a, a nice range, in fact, between minus 1 and 1. I'll come back to that in a moment. But well, what we do is we, we take the deviations of x from its mean and y from its mean, and then we multiply them together for each of the pairs. So for person number one, we get their x value and subtract the mean, and then we get their y value and subtract the mean, and then we multiply that x and y deviation together. Person number two, we subtract the mean for x of, of x from its mean, or it mean x minus its mean, y minus its mean, and multiply the two together. So we get the product, which kind of captures the connection or the relationship between the two of them. So when you do that, you end up with, let me just draw a picture to help you with this, suppose. I draw my picture a little bit differently. This time, instead of x and y axes, I'm going to draw x and y. And suppose I've got my data like this. So these data up here represent values of x which are bigger than the mean this particular point here. This is 
xi, that's x, x bar is back here. All right, that's xi. This point here represents x bar. This is yi, and this represents y bar. So any point to the right of this line here, this vertical line, is where x is bigger than x bar. You get a point of x here which is much bigger than its mean. You get a point of y also above that line, which is much bigger than its mean. Multiply those two together, you get a positive product. If you multiplied a number here by where x is bigger than its mean but y is less than its mean, you get a negative value for y minus y bar. So you get a negative product. Well, anyway, you multiply these various things together, and then you, having standardised them, and you then add together all those paired products to, and average them. So you add them together and divide by n. Well, not quite n, n minus 1, because there's some little tricky adjustment that we've got to do, which we'll get onto at another time. So what that does is it effectively allows you to capture the strength of the relationship between x and y. If I get data that's mostly like this, I get lots of positive x minus x bars being multiplied by positive y minus y bars, and then negative x minus x bars being multiplied by negative y minus y bars. Negative times a negative is a positive. So all of these dots represent products which will be negative, which will be positive rather, and therefore I get a positive correlation. On the other hand, if I have a data that looks like this, all the dots are down here and up here. I've got x is bigger than the mean here, but y is less than the mean. So I'm going to make a product of a positive number and a negative number. Or here, x is less than their mean, but y is bigger than its mean. So negative by a positive. So I get plus times a minus gives you a negative. Negative times a plus gives you a negative. So virtually all these dots are going to give you negative values for this product by this product. So I'm going to get an average of all of those negative numbers, and I'm going to get a correlation, which is negative. Now that little standardization down here was a trick that we did to give us the following result, which is that correlations range between minus 1 and 1. Here we have what we call perfect correlation, but negative correlation. In other words, there's a negative, oops, that's a very poorly drawn line, but you get the idea. The negative relationship between x and y, and it just basically follows a straight line. As x goes up, y goes down. And that gives you lots of negatives times positives in the construction of the correlation, and hence you get a correlation which is a strong negative. The other extreme is a perfect positive correlation, where if x goes up, y goes up, and they basically go up exactly identical to each other in the uh, the sense that the dots all fall on a line, and that's why we get a correlation of 1. In this case, we have no correlation at all. There is no pattern of relationship between x and y. The dots are all over the place. So I get x is bigger than their mean, and y is bigger than the mean, but also x is bigger than the mean, and y is less than the mean. And the positives products and the negative products here in this formula all average out, cancel out with each other, and I end up with a correlation of nothing. Okay, so in this particular example, it doesn't look like too much of a pattern there, but there's a reasonable correlation of 0.3 nearly. So we've got some kind of connection between education and income. The more you, and it's positive. So the more you earn, sorry, the more educated you are, the more you earn. Good news. I might just highlight that, so there's, there's a reason to stick with your course. You will earn more at the end. Of course, I hope you're doing your course for more than just earning money, but you're yeah, trying to enrich yourself and uh, you know, learn more about society and you know, stretch your brain, all those kinds of things as well. But it'd be nice to be able to get a job at the end of it, otherwise you'd just be doing an arts degree. Oops, my apologies, art students. Um, but um, the good news is that there's a reasonable correlation there. Just to compare, what about the correlation between education and how many times people visit the doctor? Well, negative, not very big, about 10.09, what's that, nearly 
one, negative 0.1, so it's not too bad. That suggests to that that more educated people go to the doctor less. So the more education you have, the less likely you are to go to the doctor. Not a strong effect, so it's not totally convincing, but there is something there. Remember when we compared income and doctor's visits and we found that rich top half people didn't go to the doctor any more or less than the people in the bottom half of the income range. And that's confirmed by the correlation. Look at that, not quite zero, but pretty close to zero, 0.005 is really small correlation. It's a number that could be anywhere between minus one and one, and it's kind of 0.005, uh, very small. So that suggests that there's no real pattern of relationship between your income level and your doctor's visits. So you learn something at least about patterns in the data from that kind of analysis. All right, I hope that's been a useful introduction to the idea of correlation. We will uh, stop there and carry on with some other things very soon. <laughs>